Welcome to the Fitness Business Podcast, brought to you by Active Management, the world's leading fitness business coaches who in 2015 will help you hashtag grow your business. This is the world's number one podcast for fitness business owners and managers. We interview real owners and learn what has been working for them to make them so successful. Here's the host of the Fitness Business Podcast, Chantal. Thanks, Harper. It's great to be back with this month's edition of the Fitness Business Podcast. And what a fantastic month it has been because I've got to interview two absolute superstars from our fitness industry. And I know, I just know that you are going to love the great information I have for you this month. So let me start by telling you a little bit about our first guest, Brent Darden. Now, Brent currently chairs several health and fitness industry executive roundtables, and he speaks on a variety of topics all over the world. He recently served as chairman of the board of directors for Ursa and was formerly the owner and general manager of the luxurious and highly awarded Tellos Fitness Centre in Dallas, Texas. Brent now provides consulting services within the health, fitness, spa industry and has done so for over 20 years. He's got extensive experience related to concept, management, operations and design of fitness centres and day spas. It makes him the perfect person to be a guest on the Fitness Business Podcast. Now, during our chat, I asked Brent about the best way to select staff for a fitness business, the advantages of sharing key numbers with your team, and I also asked him about his opinion on what attributes make a health club better. This one is a must-listen podcast for any fitness business owners wanting to work at the top of their game and wanting to create a great culture amongst your team and an industry-leading fitness offering. So I started off by asking Brent about how he goes about selecting staff during his tenure at Telos. You know, I think um, a couple of things we did that might be a little bit different, uh, which helped a lot, was making sure that even before they started the interview process, either we knew those individuals somehow that were going to be applying, or those individuals knew us and our organization first. So uh, a couple of examples of that, we got referrals for a lot of our employees from our current employees, and we incentivized our current employees to help us recruit new employees by offering a $150 bonus to them if we hired someone that they knew or someone that they recommended. And so that we got a number of our employees in that regard. We also rewarded our members when they brought employees to us as well. You know, most of our clubs have members that feel like they sort of own the club as well. And they're very invested in trying to make sure the staff is as good as it can be. So they sometimes would refer people to us. And in those cases, the individual coming to us had already heard about the organization. They knew a little bit about it from people that they'd spoke with. And so that gave us a great head start. Two other things that we did, and a number of other clubs, at least here in the U.S., are beginning to offer something similar because it's so successful. And that is we offered an internship program for students that were going to the university here in the United States. Many of those programs and health and fitness require an internship be done before they can actually graduate from the university. So we did one of those each semester of the school year. So we had one group of interns, typically three or four interns at a time in the fall, spring and summer. And then we would repeat, you know, we would do have those people during each of those semesters and they'd be with us for approximately three to four months. And that gave us, you know, great insight to them as individuals, what their strengths were, weaknesses were. And of course, they also got to know our organization very well as also to see if they might be a good fit. I would say that program has probably generated at least one fourth of all the employees in our company over the last uh, eight years, whether it's front desk employees, directors or personal trainers. Out of, out of interest, Brent, uh, what sort of age are you when you're doing an internship, roughly? Um, you're usually at that 20 to 22-year-old age. Right, yep. And as another you know, great bonus, of course, to make their internship 
high quality, we're providing them a lot of training as part of that program on customer service, on communication, on leadership, on the industry itself, on personal training. And so they, they're learning as part of that program. And that way, if we do end up hiring them, they've already been through the pipeline of initial training for almost three months. So it's good for them and it's good for the company. Absolutely. So what I'm hearing is is all these different ways that you've come about from bringing employees on, there is a connection even before they become employees and before they become staff because they're either connected via current employees, connected via members, or in this case, they've come through that intern program. Exactly. What would you say would be the advantage of sharing key numbers with your team? You know, I... <laughs> This is interesting that you asked that question. I was just consulting with a really large health club in the northeast of the United States um, just a few days ago. And as part of my consulting with them, I was researching if their club financials and their key performance indicators, their numbers, if you will, were being shared with the supervisor of the different departments, and they weren't. And I was quite disappointed in that, and as I was speaking with the fitness director who oversaw their most profitable profit center and department. In his words, he said, I felt like I was blindfolded. I don't know how we're doing. I'm just kind of going daily and doing the best I can. And I thought that was a great testimony to sharing critical information. It just helps employees feel that sense of ownership, almost like they're operating, you know, a business within a business. And it empowers them to make decisions and understand that their decisions really do matter. Letting people know what are the critical numbers to be looking at to know that you're doing well, and then sharing the reality of, of how you're performing. In other words, it's like the scoreboard. People play sports, and it's recreational, and it's fun perhaps, but it's also competitive, and you don't know whether you're winning or losing except by keeping score in businesses the same way. You shouldn't let all the players on the team not know what the score is. Absolutely. And what, what would you say, what sort of results have you seen in people as, you know, you mentioned a sense of ownership and, and empowering people. Tell me, have you got any specific examples of results that you've seen as a outcome of getting people more involved and sharing those numbers? Absolutely. Um, I'll start at the very basis. One of the things we did was what we referred to as bottom up budgeting, financial budgeting, as opposed to top down budgeting. So let's say with personal trainers, for example, we would have each individual personal trainer develop their own personal budget related to the company for the next year. In other words, predict how much revenue they were going to generate due to how many sessions they were going to deliver, how many days they were going to work, when they were going to take vacation or have time off for other things. And that was a real eye-opening experience for many of those trainers because they'd never done a business budget before. And even at their own personal level, it let them see what it was going to take to make the kind of money that they wanted to take. And it would also show them the contribution they were making, not only to their own income, but also to the company's bottom line. And then at the director level, I think that accountability factor just makes those individuals learn and grow much, much more quickly when they're held accountable to actually running their own little business, if you will. And having to justify and explain things when they're not going well and be able to celebrate when things are going really well makes them just feel really a part of it and that they're ultimately responsible for their own success. You know, there's something quite different from sharing the numbers that perhaps management has created with employees and letting the employees help create the numbers or at least the expectations for the numbers to begin with. Yeah. And the same is true, you know, with this personal training example. It's, you know, in, in a lot of clubs still, the fitness director, the general manager is saying, okay, we're going to increase revenues by a certain percentage. You're expected to improve by 3%, for example. And then you want to hold that trainer accountable throughout the coming year to those numbers. That's a little bit different than when in the very beginning, the trainer says, here's what I'm going to do. And they come to the number with you. And that, that makes a big difference. If you had to identify three attributes, and I know this is probably hard, but just three, what do you think are three attributes that can make a health club better? It is a very hard question because it's hard to narrow down to yeah. three. Which three? I'm going to start with number one being a purpose-driven culture. Mm -hmm. 
And by that, I mean really providing clarity throughout the organization at every level about why the company exists, what the company's value proposition is in the marketplace, what their philosophy is, what their core values are, and what the mission is so that employees at all levels understand why the business is operating and what the basic principles and philosophies are. Do you think that that is a key to getting new staff and in particular the younger generation more engaged with our businesses by getting them more closely involved in the elements that you mentioned like business vision and mission? Oh absolutely yeah I think um they want to feel like they're going to make a difference in their jobs and their roles in the world today more than perhaps past generations. Mm -hmm. And if you can demonstrate that your organization is about something for the greater good, which in our health and fitness industry, we certainly are yeah. helping people, you know, move better, look better, feel better is what we're all about. It's much easier to do that in this industry, frankly, than perhaps some other industries. And I love their lead in. You didn't do it on purpose, but you said employees aren't as engaged because that's my number two thing. <laughs> Perfect segue. Yeah, and that is to increase the level of employee engagement. Mm -hmm. And I think companies that have a highly engaged workforce perform better in so many different ways. Their profitability is better, research shows, that obviously their customer service is better, their morale is better, they have less sick days. And you know, maybe most importantly, when employees are really engaged and they care about the company they work for, then they're gonna perform really well, whether the managers are watching or supervising them or not. And they're gonna contribute what I call that sort of discretionary effort which means they go above and beyond their sort of normal position or job description. And, and as opportunities present themselves, if they can go above and beyond and serve the customer well or do something for the company, they're willing to do that because they're engaged. You've already shared, you know, we talked about the intern program. We talked about the PTs developing a personal budget. Can you give me one other way that you have successfully increased the level of employee engagement in your experience? You know, there's a, a lot of research out there done by the Gallup survey, and it's, it's available online if you would like to go and look at it for free. It's called the Gallup Poll Employee Engagement Survey, and it's done across all different countries, including Australia. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of good tips about what gets employees to be engaged. A few of the more critical ones would be regular feedback, not just a performance review done semi-annually or on an annual basis, but letting employees know how they're performing, both good and bad, so that people can improve. And most people want to do a good job, and they'd like to know when they are and when they aren't. And the other thing that kept coming back was that they wanted to continue learning and growing. Employees really care a lot about the fact that once they start employment with a particular organization, they want to look up in a year, two years, three years, and feel like they're a much better employee, a much better professional, and a much better person than they were when they started. So it's been really important, I think, and that's one of the greatest findings I've seen over the years is employees at all levels, they want to learn not just about how to do the specific job they're doing, but about leadership, about communication, about negotiation, about stress management, about customer service, all, all sorts of topics. And they, they thrive on feeling like they're getting better. Now we're on to number three, the third attribute that you believe can make a health club better. The third attribute I picked was having a very good customer service or member experience strategy. So many clubs, like a lot of industries, want to claim that they're very good at customer service or member experience, if you will. And unfortunately, very few pull it off. If you ask the masses to recall a place where they've had fantastic or really memorable member experience in the last month, most people, in my experience, can't hardly name a single place. So it's hard to pull off. And I think it takes effort. It takes commitment, and one of the biggest things it takes is training. I know I mentioned that on employee engagement as well, but some of the companies that are legendary for customer service, like the Ritz-Carlton uh, and others, when you look at how do they get 
to be that good at customer service, they do a lot of training with their employees. Mm -hmm. So they hire good people to begin with, but they also know that they've got to teach them how to deliver that great service. Okay, so you mentioned, you said having a very good customer service or member experience strategy, and you talked about training. When you say strategy in this context, is it that we're sitting down once a year and identifying what the member experience is? Is it getting feedback from the members on a regular basis? If so, how often or how might you go about that? Yeah, great question. It's certainly not sitting down once a year and doing a member survey. Mm -hmm. There are programs out there now that do surveys on an ongoing basis using the Net Promoter Score. Mm -hmm. uh, several in our industry specifically are, uh, let's see, 360 Review and Medallia are two of them that use the Net Promoter Score. The retention people as well offer that program. And it actually surveys a certain segment of your membership every single day so that you're getting a constant flow of feedback about your service. And that way you can be working on it continually. Excellent. One other resource that people can access for free is the URSA Retention Report. The International Health Racket and Sports Club's Retention Report is available online at the ursa.org website. And that report has confirmed through surveys of health club members specifically that the number one reason they're loyal to the organization they're with is the people. It's not the equipment. It's not the price. It's not the type of classes. But the number one reason over and over again is the friendliness and servant attitude of the people. So that's why I, that, that's why I was number three on my list. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, interestingly enough, that takes us right back around to where we started when we were talking about the importance of how it is that you're actually building your team. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Because obviously if you're sourcing, if you're recruiting people from the right place, I guess that's the first step in getting the right team together. Yeah, no question. No question. You know, that having the right person hired at the very beginning is absolutely critical. Although I would say and encourage people that even if you hire somebody that's really great, they have a great personality, they're outgoing, they have a servant's attitude, they still need to be trained in the nuances of how to deliver service and what that definition is within your organization, right? For example, a real relevant example, at the front desk, most health clubs have a front desk. You know, for that person that just graduated college and this may be their first job and they're working at the front desk in your club, good service to them might mean they pay attention when someone walks up to the desk and they try and be of service when that person's asking for help. Well, that's good. But great service means they're proactive. It means they're making eye contact before the person gets to the desk. They're answering the phone by the third ring. They're escorting the person to a location that the person's looking for rather than pointing and sending them on your way. Those are just three quick examples of a different, you know, even a person that's really good at service and has that great smile and great attitude still needs trained on how to make it exemplary. I think if clubs can pull those three things off and do those well, they're going to be pretty successful. Absolutely. Well, look, um, I just want to say thank you so much, Brent, for joining us today on the Fitness Business Podcast. It's been a pleasure. You have shared some really key insights, some great information that I know a lot of fitness business owners will be able to use uh, to help grow their business. So thank you. Thank you. I hope so. Thank you very much. Well, that was my interview with Brent Darden. Talk about some really valuable information. So much experience and so very easy to understand why he was leading an award-winning fitness business for so many years. It was an absolute privilege getting that time with Brent. And I'm sure that you'll agree you get a lot out of those insights that he shared. You're listening to the Fitness Business Podcast, and it's time for Understanding the Consumer Better with JT, the Managing Director of Active Management. Each show, we chat to JT, the Managing Director of Active Management on consumer trends and behavior. We call this part of the Fitness Business Podcast, Understanding the Consumer Better. Now, last time we spoke to JT, he gave us some great examples of how to fill and how to kill consumer waiting time. In fact, I would love to hear from any of our listeners who've come up with your own way to deal with waiting time for your members or your customers. 
So if you want to share one of your success stories, just send me an email at chantal at activemgmt.com.au. But for now, on to this week's topic. What do you have for us today, JT? Thanks, Chantel. And the special connection that your members, your clients, your consumer feels to their locality, be it the neighbourhood, the city or the country, is an impulse as old as the human race. The role that those in business play today in manifesting this local love is evolving really fast and yet simply. How so? Well, your consumer will not look for a fleeting or fun branding opportunity that you do anymore. They want a deeper long-term commitment. They want to see a lasting, meaningful impact on their locality. For example, in 2014, a study from Edelman found that 87% of consumers want a more meaningful relationship with brands and companies. And just 17% believe that brands deliver on a more meaningful relationship. So your presence in your community has to be around purpose and permanence. Okay, so do you have an example for clubs or studios? I see loads and loads of fitness businesses doing some amazing fundraising activities. Often, though, these are for national or indeed international charities. And this trend is telling us consumers, i.e. the members and clients that we have, will give us great attraction to our efforts if we fundraise for local charities or people in need. My advice is to seek out what your community really needs and try to deliver it. For example, Medibank Private, a health insurance company in Australia, they built a kid's playground when it was found kids were playing only an hour a week outdoors. What an awesome idea. So local love for businesses can effectively build a tribe around the needs of their community. That's exactly right and that should be our goal. Awesome. So JT, tell us what do you have for us on the next show? I am going to share a trend that is nicknamed Tinderization of the world. And now that should spark some interest for our listeners. That sounds very interesting. I look forward to hearing about that one. Thanks, JT. The Fitness Business Podcast is an educational podcast with the goal of positioning active management as your go-to fitness business coaches. By providing quality information, we hope it builds a relationship of trust between you and us. And you can do the same in your community with your very own podcast. It's a marketing strategy that you can use. And to get you started each month, we have this little section called Kickstart Your Podcast with our resident podcast marketing expert, Sharon. So I start by asking Sharon, why would a personal trainer or fitness business owner want to create a podcast? Well, that's a great question, Chantel, and thanks so much for having me on your show today. What I've found is that many entrepreneurs don't consider starting their own podcast simply because they don't realize the benefits that a podcast has to offer. And there are many for someone who's trying to target a specific audience and market themselves as an authority in a chosen field. For example, some of the benefits that have helped podcasts grow so much over the past few years are that they're targeted, they're on demand, and they're free. A person can be commuting to work, walking their dog, or exercising, and it's easy to listen to a short show about something new they'd like to learn or even just be entertained. I want a wonderful way for a personal trainer or a local gym to attract clientele. A short 15-minute podcast once a week or every two weeks where respected experts help give tips and motivate people to lose weight and get in shape or a show about weightlifting with some of the industry's top experts. All of this helps build your authority and credibility because certainly if those top experts are willing to share some of their valuable time with you, you must be well-respected in the industry as well. And if you have even bigger goals in mind, what a wonderful way to reach a much larger audience. When you submit your podcast to any iTunes store, it then gets put into every iTunes store around the world. So if you're located in Australia and you submit a podcast, it will show up not only in the Australian store, but also in the stores for the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, and so on. Then as your audience grows, you may find potential sponsors and advertisers approaching you for a short mention on your show. Another amazing advantage to podcasts is the availability of highly accurate statistics, So you can present your monthly download stats to that potential sponsor and negotiate a fair deal based on the predicted number of ears he or she will be reaching. 
Podcasts have been around for a decade, but thanks to smartphones, they've grown significantly in the last couple of years. Forbes magazine recently shared that 39 billion, with a B, Americans listened to a podcast in February 2014. That same magazine also discussed where podcasting is going in the next five years. Imagine this growth potential. This year, 2015, it's estimated that 50% of new cars sold will have internet connectivity. By 2025, it's expected that all cars sold will be able to connect to the internet. So that's just a quick example of the reason podcasting has grown so much and why it's really a good idea for most any entrepreneur to have one. So now's the time to jump in and claim your spot. Okay, so for our listeners that are ready to jump in, what do you recommend is the first step to getting started? Well, because the competition is growing, I wouldn't worry as much about getting every listener out there. Focus on your niche, and the best way to do that is to get very specific on identifying your audience and therefore your podcast. Well, that leaves us in the perfect spot because next month, Sharon's going to share with us her tips on identifying your podcast. Thank you so much for sharing that information with us today, Sharon. You're welcome, Chantel. Thanks for having me. The Fitness Business Podcast chats with worldwide industry leaders in their field to provide cutting edge information to help you hashtag grow your business. Our second interview this month is what we like to call the bite-sized chunk of info. Who is our guest this month, Chantal? Our second guest this month is none other than 2014 Australian Personal Trainer of the Year, Nadia Norman. Now, I've known Nadia for a number of years now, and what I love the most about her is her complete and utter honesty. I would have to say that she's one of the most down-to-earth, genuine people that I've met in the fitness industry. So it doesn't surprise me one little bit that she has clients banging down the door to book sessions with her. We chatted over a coffee at a very busy little Sydney cafe and Nadia shared some of her secrets about the keys to generating leads, converting a sale and her top three tips for running an awesome PT business. Now, before we kick off the interview, I should also mention that Nadia has a book out, Body IQ. She's an accomplished presenter and her current focus is all about helping women live a healthier, happier, freer life. You can check out more about Nadia on her website at NadiaNorman.com. But for now, let's take a listen to our bite-sized chunk of info with special guest Nadia Norman. I start by asking Nadia, how do you go about getting more clients and what's your number one lead source? I think that's the the question on every PT's lips, isn't it? Mm. And I think it really depends on, first of all, your environment. There's a big difference between whether you're in a captured market, like a a gym, and you're in-house, and there's normally a typical lead generation system that exists. Or if you're an outdoor trainer and you don't have the luxury of having a captured market, so I think you have to deal with things slightly differently. But at the end of the day, I think we can't go wrong with having a really strong brand, knowing who you are as a personal trainer, what you stand for, and what value you add to your clientele. Yeah? And once you've got your brand, and whether that's whether you're in a gym of 50 trainers or you're outdoors, your brand will attract the clientele that you stand for, I think. So if we've got having a look at the environment, yep. number one, and then identifying what's your brand and, and utilising that. Yep. So talk to me a little bit more about lead generation. Yeah, and I think there's so many different ways we can generate leads these days, not necessarily just waiting for the manager to hand over a a point of sale lead. You know, I think being a self-generating trainer is powerful. And how you can do that is by having some kick-ass marketing that generates leads. Now, that's where you use social media as a funnel, whether that you put together the old school pamphlets and you go do a street drop. You know, sometimes the old school is the best. Whether it's a case of getting yourself in front of where your audience are, whether you're using something like speaking to get in front of them. And then, of course, when you're in a gym situation, it's the whole giving away leads and giving away comps, maybe generating some stuff and or buzz in the gym where you sort of run some competitions or something like that. You know, those are all great methods of generating leads. So you've generated the leads yep. and you've, you've maybe done a comp session yep. or you've gone out and done a seminar or yep. something like that. How do you then take, and this is a, a big question I'm going to ask you to 
to, you know, summarise, yeah. I guess. How do you then go from that prospect to converting them into a, a paying client? So I think I've always maintained this mindset right from when I first started PT, and I don't know where I got this from, but essentially anyone who I come into contact with, I assume is a client. It's a case of them working out the logistics at the end as to what sort of working relationship we're going to have. So I feel like when you walk into a situation like that, you're in a more powerful sort of position. And then the client's not sitting there going, oh my God, this person's desperate, they need me as a client. So you can then take that aside and you can offer value. So pretty much, I do comp with anyone. I know that some trainers don't like to do free comps, but it just sits really well with me. And in that comp session is where I'm doing a needs analysis, a movement analysis, really getting to know the person, understanding what their underlying motivation is, and then I display value by showing them what they want and also giving them what they need. So if you were if you were to then flip that and, and put yourself in the shoes of the customer yep. um, and they've experienced that, what, if, what do you think their feeling is? What is it that you're giving to them by going through that process with them? I think confidence. They need to know that they can trust their trainer, trust that they have the information and the knowledge to get them to wherever they need to go, but trust in their skills, rapport, yeah. and you have to establish relationships. I mean, it's pretty obvious that it's called personal training for a reason, right? And not, you're not going to get on with every potential lead, and that's okay. They might not end up being part of your tribe, and that's completely okay as well. So I think, you know, you have to really show value in what your skills are as a PT, but also make that potential client feel absolutely amazing yep. and feel like they that you are the answer to their problem. Yep. If we were to take that a step further then yep. and say um, you've built that rapport, you've gotten to that situation, do you then find because you have connected with that person, because you've built that rapport and you've invested in them and you've listened to them, is it, does it, the word sale then come out of it? It just it just becomes? Like, uh, talk absolutely. about that, yeah. that experience. You know, I have not had to sell anything in uh, maybe since 1980, <laughs> <laughs> maybe when I first... Started. Yep. To me, the word sell would indicate that you haven't done the front end stuff. You haven't taken the time to build rapport, listen to that person, really tap inside their head. You haven't demonstrated value. If you're having to sell, you're you're on the back foot. Yep. I think, just personally. Yep. So for me, as you just said, it is it's not a question of am I going to get this as a client, this person as a client, it's how are we going to work together. Yep. And it just happens authentically. Yeah. And organically, I guess. Beautiful, beautiful. If you could summarise, say, three tips that you'd give a PT business owner or even maybe a club owner or a club manager um, for running a kick-ass business, yep. what would those three tips be? I think I've said this a couple of times. The number one, know your brand mm-hmm. and know your tribe. Mm-hmm. Who are you? What do you stand for? What's your philosophies? And therefore, who's your target market? When you've got that clarity, everything else falls into place. Uh, the second thing, I have mentioned this multiple times as well, um, over-deliver on value. We're a service industry, but we're also a relationship industry. So if you just keep over-delivering on that, it speaks volumes. And then three, I think I'm going to use the word execution. Yeah. I think it's very easy for a lot of new trainers or business owners to get caught up in the planning phase and planning stage over and over again. They feel like they just have to keep planning till the cows come home. You can have the best plans in the entire world. If you don't execute, you're never going to know what's, what's good or what's not. So I think that kind of, you know, make sure you're constantly executing. Okay, so thinking about that, that, that is sometimes the stumbling block for yeah. a lot of people is the yeah. idea is there but the ability to execute yeah. is, is difficult. How do you find when you do have a big idea or you have, you know, you think I want to release a new program or whatever, what are the steps that you would take um, to go from idea to to action? Yeah, okay. Um, Big question. Mm. The first thing is I need to know, okay, so what's happening in that gap? Is it I, I need to know or find resources? Or is it I have a lack of resources? Am I lacking in, in particular knowledge or information? So I try and work out what is it that I've got in my head already and what do I need to seek out? And then I'll 
I'll seek out that particular knowledge that I need. Then the next thing I do is I'll just launch it. <laughs> jump in head I just first. jump in because at the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't matter. You're gathering information. And I have it in my head that my first three or four times rolling out a new campaign or a new project or a new anything, it's not going to be smooth. Never be smooth. So in that sense, good is good enough and just execute. And do you, let's say in that situation, do you fly solo or do you normally get someone, do you bounce ideas off someone, do you have a coach that you speak to, do you have a colleague that you might work with and say, How's, what do you think about this idea? Um, do you have someone that maybe assists with administration or the marketing or anything else like that or are you, are you a one-man band? <laughs> Up until just recently, I've pretty much done everything on my own. Yep. Um, you know, there's always, you've got mentors, and um, coaches that you bounce ideas off. But one of the biggest things that I've learned is just to trust my own instincts. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to get stagnant or hit that stumbling block because so many people are telling you this or you read something and it's telling you something else and there's so much information coming at you that you just don't make a move. Whereas just trust your gut instinct and, and go with what you know. It's got to be better than nothing. Absolutely. I love it. So know your brand, know your tribe. So tribe is, is your target market, those yep. people that you're you are working with. Um, over-deliver on value yep. because it's all about relationships. It is personal training, as you say, and, and really execute. Don't just stick on the plan. Actually go about and, and make action off the back of that plan. Yep. Action, yep. action. Every single day, yep. do something that takes you closer to your goals, hands down. Nadia, thank you so much. That, thank you. That you. wraps us up for the official interview. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much. And I personally value the opportunity to speak to you. It's, it's really special to have you as a guest on the podcast. And I can't wait to share this information Thanks, with Michelle. all of our listeners. <laughs> Thanks, team. <laughs> it's time for the Fitness Business Podcast Wrap. So there you have it. Another great episode of the Fitness Business Podcast. In fact, there were so many good things in there that my top five list for today actually has six things in it. I couldn't help myself. So here are my favorite takeaways from my chat first of all with Brent Darden. Number one, when you're recruiting new staff, get a head start by seeking referrals from your current employees. Number two, create a purpose-driven culture. Think about your why, what, philosophy, core values, and your mission. And most importantly, share it with your team. And number three, employees at all levels want to learn, not just about their jobs, but about all sorts of topics within the business. They thrive on learning new information. And from my chat with Nadia Norman, she tells us that your brand will attract the clientele that you stand for. Be sure to get yourself some kick-ass marketing that generates leads. And last of all, always give comp sessions. And in the comp session, aim to understand that person's underlying motivation. In the next episode of the Fitness Business Podcast, I chat to the retention guru himself, Dr. Paul Bedford. There is some super information in that interview for you. Now, I'm not going to give away too much just yet, but I will tell you that Paul gives us his top three strategies to build member retention. Don't miss that one. We also have the internationally acclaimed and award-winning personal and corporate fitness trainer, Mish McCormack. Mish and I chatted about some of the challenges that PTs face when transitioning from a contractor model to having your own studio. Plus, she shares with us her three best pieces of advice for PTs in their first six months in the industry. It's fair to say it's going to be a jam-packed 40 minutes. I can't wait to share next month's episode with you all. Now, don't forget to jump on and rate the Fitness Business Podcast on iTunes if you found the last 40 minutes to be valuable. And feel free to email me your suggestions, comments, feedback. My direct email address is chantal at activemgmt.com.au. I would love to hear from you. And until next month, what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. You have been listening to the world's number one podcast called the Fitness Business Podcast, brought to you by Active Management. We are dedicated to helping your fitness business hashtag grow in 2015. Check out www.activemgmt.com.au for resources, tools, and more to help you. 
And by far, the best value for you is to become a member. So join today at www.activemgmt.com.au.